Thank you, Bonnie. And I especially uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, introduce our next speaker um, uh, because uh, Chief Glenna Wallace is a, a family friend. Her, uh, her family and, and my family have very close connections. And, um, and I appreciate Bonnie's comments about the connection with place because I'm going to take us back before I do the, um, uh, Chief Glenna's introduction, talk a little bit about um, place. And um, we're here in West Virginia celebrating and acknowledging the, the tribes that were indigenous to West Virginia. And as you know by now, um, the Shawnee tribe and the Seneca tribes were very much a part of West Virginia's history. And um, that uh, goes back to the 1700s and earlier. And I want to take you back 249 years ago today, October 10th, 1774, marks the anniversary of the Battle of Point Pleasant. Point Pleasant was then in, in Virginia, that was before West Virginia existed as a state, and um, the Battle of Point Pleasant took place October 10, 1774. It was the main battle in Dunmore's War where uh, colonial Virginia militia came to what is now West Virginia, Virginia to um, uh, engage in combat with the Seneca and Shawnee. That battle took place on October 10th, 1774. Um, there was a, a number of tribal leaders that were involved in that. A number of tribes were involved with it, um, including Seneca and Shawnee. Sometimes the Seneca are referred to in the history books as um, Mingo, or even more generically as Ohio River Indians. But the um, Seneca and Shawnee participated in the Battle of Point Pleasant against Virginia militia. After the battle, the Seneca and Shawnee retreated across the Ohio River into what is now Ohio. Um, the Seneca and Shawnee were later uh, uh, placed on a reservation in Western Ohio. And then during the Trail of Tears, um, both tribes were removed to Indian Territory. Both tribes had reservations that were near each other in Indian Territory. And until 1867, there was a period of time when um, the Shawnee and Seneca were actually politically united. Our, our name of our tribe was the United Nation of Seneca and Shawnee, and that lasted until 1867. So very close ties with the what today is the Seneca Cayuga Nation and the Eastern Shawnee Tribe, and, um, and including a lot of uh, family relations and a lot of friendships that exist um, to this day. So this is a, a very special um, moment for me to introduce our, our next speaker, um, uh, Chief Glenna Wallace. Oh, I'm, I sh I'll throw one more factoid out there. Uh, back in the days when it, our tribes were united as the United Nation of Seneca Sh and Shawnee, um, the, up until 1867, the chief of the tribe was a man named Lewis Davis. Lewis Davis was my great-great-grandfather. So there's a lot of ties between our two tribes that go way back. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and introduce our next speaker. Uh, Glenna J. Wallace was first elected chief of the Eastern Shawnee tribe in 2006. She was born in Ottawa County, Oklahoma, and has lived within 15 miles of her birthplace most of her life. She's the first female to, from her family to graduate from high school, the first female to gra from her family to graduate from college, and she spent 38 and a half years as an instructor, department chair, division chair, director of travel, and interim academic dean at Crowder College in Neosho, Missouri. She is deemed a master teacher by the administration, faculty, and students, and she estimates that she has taught about 25,000 students over the years. Many of them still keep in touch with her today. Um, Chief Glenna also serves um, as, um, by the way, Chief Glenna is, uh, she'll, she'll back me up on this. A lot of people refer her to her as Chief Glenna, but um, Chief Wallace will be the official uh, name. Uh, Chief Wallace um, has served as chair of the uh, Claremore, Oklahoma Indian Hospital Health Board as Secretary of the Intertribal Council of Nine Tribes located in Ottawa County. Um, that includes both the Eastern Shawnee Tribe and the Seneca Cayuga Nation. And she has served as a trustee of Kansas City University. 
As mentioned, she was elected chief of the tribe in 2006, and she continues to hold that post to this day. Prior to be electing, elected chief, she also served on the Eastern Shawnee Business Council for 18 years. Now, the Eastern Shawnee tribe has had a lot of change during her um, service, her time of, as, of service, being on the tribal council for 18 years and serving as the chief since 2006. During that time, the Eastern Shawnee tribe has had a major infrastructure reorganization, moving many of their facilities out of a floodplain into a different area. Um, the tribe has had a major uh, language uh, immersion and revitalization program going on. The tribe has developed, uh, uh, established an early childhood learning center, and tribal land holdings have skyrocketed from 400 acres to over 2,500 acres today. Um, I, I'm not going to um, uh, talk about this too much because I think uh, Chief Wallace is going to talk about this, but she has been a major force in the um, recent United Nations um, uh, designation of the Hopewell sites in Ohio as part of the a World Heritage, uh, as a part of the World Heritage System of sites. And I think that's only the 25th site in the whole United States that has been designated as a World Heritage Site. And Chief Wallace has had, played a major uh, role in that happening. I think she's going to be talking about that a little bit today. So without any further ado, I will turn the time over to Chief Glenna Wallace. Chris just gave you half of my speech. <clears throat> I returned from Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia, just about uh, two weeks ago. Um, three of our party returned with COVID. I returned with a terrible cold, and I still have that cold and finally decided that uh, the day before I came here or left for Ohio, that maybe I should go to the doctor to get something for that cold. And the doctor told me I didn't have a cold, I had pneumonia. So um, I'm coughing, I hope I can get through this, but if I don't, just have patience with me, okay? So I want to start off and say that um, I am the first elected female chief of the Eastern Shawnee tribe. And that happened in 2006, and I'm proud of that. But I'm even more proud of the fact that I've been reelected four times for four-year terms each time. And I would like to say that I'm an authority upon the history of the Eastern Shawnee tribe with West Virginia, but I cannot tell a lie. So I am not an authority, but many of the things that Chris mentioned, uh, he lives here in West Virginia and he knows far more about it. Uh, I did know all of the things that he said except the exact date and was going to say that um, um, Cornstalk, Gun Dunmore War, Nanhalema, um, a female, and um, Mount Pleasant, the battle there, and uh, those were things that I was going to briefly talk about, but I don't need to talk about that now. Let me just say that um, Shawnee Indians, there are today three federally recognized Shawnee tribes. All of us live in Oklahoma. And so we are called, uh, all of us were given um, names by the government uh, with the exception of the Shawnee tribe. And so I'll just uh, tell you quickly about the three Shawnee tribes there in Oklahoma. We are called the Eastern Shawnee tribe because we reside in the extreme northeast corner of Oklahoma. We reside in a county that's called Ottawa County, and there are nine federally recognized tribes in one county. You just heard the Cherokee speaker talk about having 13 or 14 counties where they have uh, their jurisdiction, and uh, we have nine tribes in one county, 
and it's a very small county. The population is only about 30,000. So most of us have small tribes there. My tribe is approaching 3,800, so that's the size that we are. And I would say that if uh, we're going to talk about uh, why we're there and why we were in West Virginia, let me just say that we can document that we lived in at least 26 states. We were, I would say if you're going to use any modern song at all, and this one certainly isn't modern, but within the last 50 years, there's that country western song that says, I've been everywhere, man. Well, that's evidently what our people were singing all along the way. Um, and so we were here in West Virginia. And so all three were nomadic type tribes. We, we simply moved from place to place. The reason, we didn't believe that you could own land. We believed that land belonged to everyone and we believed that we all needed to protect the land. We were indeed loving the land and taking care and we knew that if we stayed in certain places too long, we would deplete all of the hunting animals there. And uh, so we oftentimes refer to ourselves as the first early environmentalists because we took care of the land and respected the land. We didn't necessarily live in Kentucky, although we were there. Kentucky was our hunting land, and so we protected that land because we needed those animals to remain because we were hunters and gatherers. So the second tribe, and not necessarily as far as chronology is concerned, but another tribe that we have in, in uh, Oklahoma that's a Shawnee tribe is called the Absentee Shawnee tribe. And you'll hear me talk about a little bit later, and Chris mentioned this, that we were definitely affected by the Civil War. And um, after the Civil War, there was an omnibus treaty bill that was signed, and that omnibus treaty bill occurred in 1867. Because all of us were so nomadic during our history, um, the Absentee Shawnee tribe, uh, they didn't have the name Absentee Shawnee at that particular time, but they already had a trip planned and they were going to take off toward Texas and Mexico. And so that treaty, as, and they said, there's never been a treaty that the United States has kept, so why in the world should we alter our plans and stick around to sign a piece of paper that's not going to be observed anyway? So they went ahead and left. And in that treaty, there is a line that says a group of Shawnees who were absent. And that's how they received their name, Absentee Shawnee. Um, I kind of joke with them once in a while because at first they weren't too proud of that name. But when gaming came to Oklahoma, um, we as tribes, the Absentee Shawnee tribe there, at least 200 miles from us, maybe close to 300 miles. And so we don't see each other on a daily basis or a monthly basis or even on a yearly basis. There were many years that passed that we were really not that connected. And when gaming came to Oklahoma, gaming has so many laws, so many regulations, and so many conferences that we all started getting together to attend those. Um, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Uh, at least that's the, the number today. That, that number can fluctuate so, some, but uh, <clears throat> when they started these conferences, they line us up alphabetically. So who's at the front of the line? The absentee Shawnees. And I say, I would trade places with you almost any day. You know, you could take our name and I'll take the name absentee so that we don't have to stand in line so long. So they were the absentees. And then the Chief Barnes will be speaking next and I'm sure he'll talk about this, but his tribe is the Shawnee tribe. And they were part of, they were under the umbrella of the Cherokees and they did not seek their recognition until about the year they were recognized in the year 2000. And they went through the legislative process of being uh, federally recognized and uh, they, it, they were required to take the, the original name when we were all together. So they are the Shawnee tribe, we are the Eastern Shawnee tribe, and then we have the absentee Shawnee tribe, all located there in Oklahoma. So as I say, we uh, can document that we were in at least 26 different states, and um, but Ohio was our last state that we were in. And as Chris indicated, um, we were called the mixed band while we were on a reservation there in Ohio, and uh, that happened in 1817. 
Before that, 1795 was the Treaty of Greenville, and the Treaty of Greenville set the Ohio River as the basis that we couldn't go past it. And so we went from 26 states on down to fewer and fewer, then restricted to certain places in Ohio, and then ultimately, in 1817, placed upon a reservation where we were known as the mixed band of Senecas and Shawnees. We were together. They lived on one end of the reservation. We lived on the other end. It was called the Lewistown Reservation. Uh, it is believed the chief of that reservation was a man by the name of sometimes he's referred to as Captain Lewis and sometimes he is Colonel Lewis. And um, so it was Lewistown Reservation and we were there until uh, the Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830. We were the first group, the mixed band, the Senecas and Shawnees, to have a treaty forced upon us that we had to sign saying that we would be removed. And we were the first group to be forcibly removed from Ohio after the Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830. They wanted us to go by watercraft our people refused. Our ancestors said, no, uh, we don't have any trust in the United States. Uh, perhaps um, uh, they, you will give us blankets that are laced with cholera, or we're afraid of uh, the ships themselves, the watercraft, that they're not that safe because they might catch on fire and it might be deliberate and so that you would, we would be annihilated. So my ancestors, our ancestors said, we will leave Ohio as we came to Ohio on foot, perhaps with horses, perhaps with a few wagons. And so they walked every step of the way from Ohio to Indian Territory. Along the way, 15% of the people died. They had to leave them as they went on their march. We left in September. We arrived in the cold month of December in Oklahoma. And it's documented that the first thing that the chiefs did was to go and beg food for their starving people. We continued to have difficult times. <clears throat> um, we were there from 1832, and when they took us there, they took us to the wrong place. They actually took us over into Cherokee area, and our people did not like that area because we were woodland tribes and there were no trees. It was not an area that they were familiar with. And so they moved us back across what would be called the Spring River and um, the, what's the other river? Spring River and the, the Neosho River there. And so we're in the area that's called Twin Bridges where those two, bridge, two uh, rivers come together. And uh, we have been there ever since. We remained together as one group from the 1832 when we, or 1817 until uh, 1867. So you know that we were together for more than 50 years. And as he in indicated, we still live close to each other. Uh, the tribe from our tribe over to where their tribe is, uh, the headquarters would probably be a distance of 15 to 20 miles. Uh, we still uh, cooperate with them, they cooperate with us. And in Ottawa County, uh, we have nine tribes. Seven of us of the nine tribes were forcibly removed from Ohio Valley. So <clears throat> that's our history. Uh, I do wanna say that something that a lot of people are not aware is that when that omnibus treaty bill was signed, when we signed the treaty with the government in 1831. The two tribes, we were promised 60,000 acres. 60,000 acres. That's in print, that's in writing. My tribe ended up with 58.19 acres. 58.19 acres. One of the reasons for that, there are two main reasons, but one of the main reasons for that is the Civil War. That when the Civil War occurred and when they signed, because there were other tribes, as I indicated, that were forced from Ohio. In fact, Ohio, um, the number will vary depending upon the source that you read, but it will indicate that there were 
at least 44 different tribes in Ohio. Some numbers will say 45, some sources will say 46. But 44, 45, 46 tribes in Ohio all were forced to remove. So there's not a single tribe, federally recognized tribe, in Ohio today. And so when we moved, expecting 60,000 acres, uh, that's what we had until that Civil War occurred. And when the Civil War occurred, um, an omnibus, omnibus treaty, um, pro oh, it, during that Civil War, uh, several of the tribes there in Oklahoma joined the uh, Confederate State Association there. And so we fought on the side of the Confederacy some of the tribes were removed and went to Kansas first. And so uh, Chief Barnes' tribe is often referred to as the loyal Shawnees, meaning that they were loyal to the Union, whereas we were on the side of the Confederacy. And when that war was over and the omnibus bill was passed, those tribes that were removed to Kansas, uh, most of them came down into Ottawa County where we are today and we were forced to sell that acreage to several of those tribes. Uh, the Wyandotte tribe, they came down from Kansas and they purchased 25,000 of those acres. The Ottawa tribe, they came down from Kansas, uh, they purchased almost 15,000 acres. The Modoc tribe, they were not part of the removal from Ohio, they were removed from the area of Oregon and California. Uh, we, we were forced to sell them 4,000 acres. And then with allotment, allotment took all the land away from the tribe and placed it in the names of the individuals. So we really didn't have any land whatsoever, except we had one tribal member who had an allotment that she contacted the government saying that she was married. She was married to um, an Indian, a Kiowa Indian and uh, lived at Colony, Oklahoma, and she was asking if she could trade her allotment there in Ottawa County for an allotment there at Colony, Oklahoma. That happened in 1937. The government told her, yes, they would do that, but at that time there were no Shawnee tribes in the area, so they would hold that allotment, that 58.19 acres that she had, until a Shawnee tribe was organized and had a constitution, had an election. That happened to us. Uh, we were working on that at that time, and in 1939, we adopted our first constitution, uh, had our charter, had our first election, elected our first chief, and um, at that time, we inherited that 58.19 acres. So that's all the land that we had for years and years and years. I should say that when that omnibus bill was passed, as uh, Chris pointed out, his great-great-grandfather uh, signed many of the papers and was uh, indicated, uh, starting with being interpreter, but then gradually continued to uh, be there and be present, and he was chief of the mixed band when that happened. And in that 1867 omnibus treaty, that's when they separated the two of us. And they became the Seneca Cayuga tribe, and we became the Eastern Shawnee tribe there in 1867. Because we had fought on the side of the Confederacy, it's almost as though we were punished by the Union, who of course were the victors in that Civil War. And Chris didn't tell you, but his great-great-grandfather was placed in prison and charged with treason. And so uh, his family truly has a history of service toward uh, Native Americans and, and particularly our two tribes. And um, he is known now as the Seneca Cayuga chief, but he was chief of both bands uh, when we were mixed together. Things have changed since uh, 1867. We were, uh, we had the 58.19 acres, but you wouldn't call that prime land. We we're in a floodplain, and uh, we flood at least twice a year, oftentimes three times a year. So uh, since we became a federally recognized tribe in 1939, 
Uh, we have been gradually trying to relocate about four or five miles up the road on a highway that's out of the floodplain. And so we've had to build all new buildings. Um, our lives really changed in 1984. Um, we did not have any property. Uh, we did not have any buildings until 1977. And in 1977, our tribe built what was considered to be an economic development building. And um, we received our first grant from the United States, and it was $100,000 to build this building. It was not sufficient to build the building, and the contractor left in the middle of the night, and the building was not finished, and there were still bills to be paid. So that building remained empty from 1977 until 1984. In 1984, that's when, um, she said you might laugh when they say they started their economic development with bingo. Uh, well, that's where our economic development began also in 1984. <coughs> And we've always had very close relationships with the Seneca Cayuga. And Chris probably won't appreciate my telling this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Because uh, the Seneca Cayugas already had bingo uh, before 1984. The Senecas and the Quapaws had bingo. And uh, there was a gentleman uh, who had um, an agreement, uh, I'll say maybe a contract, I don't know. Anyway, he was the one who was responsible for putting bingo in for the Seneca Cayugas. Uh, prior to 1984, and um, it was very successful, um, both attendance-wise and financially. And so the Seneca Cayuga decided that they wanted a total control of that bingo, and so they either did not renew a contract or they indicated the time was up or something or the other. Anyway, they, they parted company, and they took over 100% um, control of their bingo hall. This gentleman knew that we were a tribe and knew that we had an unfinished building on Indian land, so we would be eligible for Indian gaming. And so he came and proposed to us essentially what he had with the Seneca Cayugas, that he would be responsible for remodeling the entire building, finishing it, that he would teach us how to play bingo, that he would hire as many of our tribal citizens as possible. And um, we didn't question him because from the very beginning, he indicated that he wanted to open that bingo hall December the 7th, 1984. We didn't ask why. December the 7th to me was always Pearl Harbor, but surely that didn't have anything to do with it. And so he rushed and rushed. And it's true, we opened our bingo hall on December the 7th, 1984. Only then did we find out why he wanted to open that hall December the 7th, 1984. Because he said, I'm going to drop a bomb on those damn Seneca Cayuga Indians. And so that was how we opened our bingo hall. And it was tremendously successful. It was built to house between 300 and 400 people. And oftentimes, we had 900 people there. Um, I was there the night of the opening. Uh, there were 14 employees there. I was not an employee. Uh, my sister had contracted to run the concession stand, and she didn't have money to pay anybody salary. I was teaching at Crowder College, and uh, we're, our bingo hall was going to be open only on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. So that meant I could still teach all of my classes, and I could help her then on the Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, this is really going back, you'd think this is two centuries ago, uh, but I was there uh, every weekend uh, and saw so many different things, and we were actually raided by the FBI. Uh, we actually carried guns, we had shotguns, we had big dogs there. Uh, we, uh, were, we, we knew that we were going to be raided, and so we were, we were prepared for that three months. I was there the, the day, the night that the FBI did raid us. They confiscated everything we had in that building. Uh, so I could tell you story after story of what it was like for a tribe to try to begin economic development at a time when we didn't have any. Uh, it was quite successful. And then in uh, 2003, it was so successful, and we had added on to that building three times. 
that we then decided that we, uh, the at that time machines were coming into being. So at that point it was just uh, bingo and uh, pull tabs. And uh, in 2003, we opened a new uh, casino called uh, Border Town because we are right on the border of Oklahoma and Missouri. And then uh, that was so successful and we were still on that 58.19 acres and uh, we were not on a highway. Uh, you had to come through Missouri uh, to get back into Oklahoma where we were located. And so we bought property up on Highway 60 that was in our old reservation and put it in 2012, put in a casino that's known as Indigo Sky, uh, which is a, a beautiful casino and is quite successful today. So that's the story of the Eastern Shawnee tribe. Uh, today, <coughs> we have about 3,800 members <coughs> today. Uh, we have a policy that uh, we try our best that however many prof how much profit we make that year, 50% of that profit goes back to our tribal citizens. We do not have per cap, but we watch our budgets and, and that's how we uh, plan our budgets is that 50% goes back to our tribal citizens. So what do we do? Um, anyone who goes to college, uh, if, if they're enrolled full time, they receive a minimum of 6,000 per semester. If they are in uh, graduate programs, that goes to 8,000 a semester. If they are in programs that are medical or legal, uh, that goes to 9,000 per semester. We have uh, programs for our elders where uh, we specify what would be eligible for them to have their reimbursement. So we pay their uh, home insurance, we pay their car insurance. We will give so much money toward um, medical. We'll give so much money uh, for uh, if they are elder and need to have their their lawns mowed, we will pay for lawn mowing. Uh, we will uh, pay for uh, other such things, uh, utilities. So for our elders, it amounts to about 5,000 minimum a year. And for our children, uh, we uh, pay $750 for them to have school clothing to begin. Uh, we also play, uh, pay medical. Uh, we also uh, pay what we simply call supplemental in that there are many worthwhile organizations that we feel some families just can't afford to pay the dues that costs for those things. And so we will pay those so that our children will become involved. Uh, we uh, buy computers when they are juniors or seniors in high school. We will give them $750 extra when they are juniors and seniors because we feel that there are extra expenses in those years. We want to do everything we possibly can to encourage our students to remain in school and to graduate from high school and then to have no reason to say that they can't go on to vocational training or to academic training. Uh, so that's where our 50% goes to uh, for all of our people. We have elections. Our terms are for four years. We have uh, five business committee members and then we have a, a second chief and a chief. Being the first, um, Chris almost apologized for saying the formal name should be Chief Wallace, but being the first female elected, uh, my first meeting with staff, that was the first question they asked me, what do we call you? They'd never had a female and I guess they thought they couldn't call a female chief. And so I said, well, you may call me Chief Glenna. And so I have been called Chief Glenna most of the time. I've been called a few other things, but <clears throat> we won't talk about those. So I've been called Chief Glenna uh, since that day one almost. And uh, with correspondence, it is Chief Wallace, but uh, in person, it's usually Chief Glenna. So uh, I would say that throughout history, Shawnees have been known as being fierce warriors, fierce fighters. I would say we haven't changed. We just fight in a different way. We fight today with ballots. We fight with resolutions. We fight by attending conferences. We fight by visiting with our legislators. <coughs> we fight by <clears throat> identifying the causes that we are interested in and where we feel that we're not being treated justly. So we are still warriors today, and I salute every one of you 
who is here, who serves on a business committee, who serves as a chief or who serves as a president, because you are warriors as well, because we still have many battles we have to fight today. And so you wonder what those battles are. Some of them have been mentioned, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, the Delaware chief told you that uh, he had a case here in the state of West Virginia, but the Indian Child Welfare Act was challenged throughout the United States and finally went to the Supreme Court. And we were worried that that was going to be overturned and we worked and we worked and the Supreme Court did vote seven to two to uphold the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, <clears throat> one of the others has indicated that our governor uh, is um, uh, a Cherokee. No, <laughs> our governor is uh, <clears throat> um, not necessarily uh, friendly it appears for Native Americans, and we have many battles with, with our governor, and we have to work with our legislators. Uh, we have something that's in the state of Oklahoma that is unique, that we've had something that's been called the McGirt Act. Uh, McGirt was a uh, uh, Muscogee, no, not a Mus it, it happened in the Muscogee Territory, but he was a, another Native American, and uh, he committed a crime and it was a horrible crime, and he was uh, tried in state court and was found guilty. Uh, he believed that uh, because the crime was committed, it may have been committed in the state of Oklahoma, but it was committed specifically in the jurisdictional area of the Muscogee Creek. And so he said his case should have been tried in a tribal court, not a state court. And uh, that went all of the way up to the Supreme Court as to whether tribal jurisdiction still existed, meaning reservations. So meaning the land that was given to us in our treaty back in 1831, the 60,000 acres that it established ultimately where the Wyandots were, where the, uh, where the Seneca Cayugas were, where the Eastern Shawnees were, where the Modocs, are those reservations still intact or have those reservations disappeared? And they've used the term of established or disestablished so now every one of us has to go through the process of proving that we still have a reservation. And at this point, um, something like nine or 10 out of the 39 tribes have proven that they have reservations. My tribe happens to be, <clears throat> it's interestingly enough, that the uh, Ottawa tribe uh, and the Modoc tribe, they have um, land that came from uh, Shawnee, Seneca land, uh, the Ottawas have been determined that their reservation is still intact. My tribe has not been ruled upon. So we're in a state of, are we established or are we disestablished? And that affects some of the grants that we can apply for and some of the funding. Uh, so we continue to have our battles that we must fight today and that we must unify and that we need to cooperate with. So I don't want you to think, oh, it's all over and done with. They were removed and we're there and it's all peace right now. That's simply not the situation. There are other battles that we have. And so I wanted to talk about some experiences that I have just had recently that the rest of you have not had. And that is the fact that uh, while I was there at Crowder College, um, it was a, a new college that was established and I wore many, many hats and I was able to wear hats that I wanted to wear and so I basically established my own job description. And in doing that, um, Crowder College is located in an area that is uh, poverty stricken as far as both finances and as far as fine arts and, and culture. And so our students and I was named the director of the fine arts uh, and cultural program as well as communications. And uh, we would have some wonderful things that came to the campus, but we wouldn't have very many people to attend. So it became apparent that we were going to have to take students away and expose them to fine arts and cultural opportunities. And so we designed a, a travel program and that travel program meant that I was director also of international travel and within the United States travel. So two times a year, I took, oh, 50, 60 students, community members to various places in the world. And once a year, I took them to places in the United States. That meant that even though I've lived within 15 miles of where I was born, 
I've traveled to more than 70 countries and have traveled to uh, all but one state, I think it is, in the United States and taking students to those places. I was not even aware at the, when I first began this program that I was taking these students to places that had famous names. And I later realized they had famous names because they were World Heritage Sites. So that meant I was taking them to places like the Great Wall of China. I was taking them to the pyramids in Egypt. I was taking them to Notre Dame in Paris. I was taking them to the finest musicals, to the finest museums uh, in the world. Um, so we were going to see Les Miserables. We were going to see the Phantom of the Opera. We were going to see uh, Cats. We were, uh, so all of those experiences and in addition to that, we also uh, began to have uh, student exchanges and faculty exchanges. And so in those faculty exchanges, I was able to go to both England and to um, Australia and teach uh, for some time. And we were able to have students come into our homes from foreign countries that have enriched our lives forever. So uh, when I was elected chief in 2000, then in 2000, something else happened in my life that, uh, as I've indicated, my tribe is located exactly on the Oklahoma-Missouri line. So I live within two miles of my tribal headquarters where my offices are, yet I'm on the Missouri side. I don't live in Oklahoma. And in 2000, the director of humanities in Missouri came to my office and said that he wanted me to do something for the state of Missouri that in 2006, we were going to be observing the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. And of course, the Lewis and Clark Bi uh, Corps of Discovery uh, began in Missouri. And um, he wanted to make sure that every tribe that was mentioned in the Lewis and Clark journals that was in Missouri received recognition and was a major part of the programs that would be held there in Missouri. And I told him I could not do that, and he didn't understand that because uh, I had uh, done several other things. And uh, he said, why? And I said, because you're wanting me to talk about something. I don't have a problem getting up and talking with you. Um, Deborah Dodson was there keying, typing quickly into her computer to get her speech in, you know, and she said, I know you never write a speech out. You never write your notes or this or that, and that's true. Uh, but I said, I, I can speak when I know something, but I don't know about the history of my tribe. Nobody does. Uh, when books have been written in the past, they've been written primarily about the absentees and the loyal Shawnees. They haven't been written about the Eastern Shawnees. We couldn't tell you who our chiefs were. We couldn't tell you where all the states where we had lived. We couldn't tell you anything. And I said, that's on my bucket list. I intend to research that when I retire. And he said, this is the year 2000. This program doesn't begin until 2003. You have three years to research. You have three years to learn about your tribe. And my, I kept going this way, no, I can't do this. I can't do this. Unfortunately, my college president was standing behind him and he was going this way, you know. And I kept going, no, I can't do this. And the college president was going like this and I, um, uh, Yes, I'll do this. So for three years, I researched Shawnees. And in researching Shawnees, it meant I was researching Ohio because that was our homeland. That's the last place we had been. So for three years, I traveled to Ohio as much as I could. I read every book I could. I read everything that Ohio produced. I talked with as many people as possible. And in 2003 through 2006, I presented programs throughout Missouri and other states about Lewis and Clark and the Indians there, particularly in Missouri. We were one of the first tribes mentioned because um, by 1800, uh, we had more people, more Shawnees who had left Ohio and living in the state of Missouri, particularly at Cape Girardeau, which is right there at the Mississippi River. And, um, Lewis and Clark went to Cape Girardeau because they didn't have any experience in uh, watercraft. And so they went and practiced on the Mississippi River to learn how to navigate and, and to how to uh, work with uh, that watercraft that they were taking. So in 2006, when I began those programs, um, 
that was the same year that I had been employed at Crowder for 38 and one half years. I had my retirement locked in and it was time to elect a new chief. We were having an election that year and uh, my brother encouraged me to run. And so I ran for chief and was elected. In 2007, uh, Ohio State University was sponsoring a lecture series about Native Americans and one of their guests that they invited was an author by the name of John Sugden. John Sugden had written a marvelous biography of Tecumseh and John Sugden was coming from England and coming to Ohio State University to give a lecture. I wanted to hear John Sugden speak. And so I drove from Missouri to Ohio to hear that lecture, no other reason. I heard him that night, he was marvelous. What I did not know is that the next day, anyone invited to be one of those lecturers had to attend a place called Newark Earthwork Mounds that's located at Newark, Ohio. I went along simply because I would be in the company of John Sugden. I had never heard of Newark Earthwork Mounds. I had never seen of New Newark Earthwork Mounds. I had never read anything, even though I'd read all of those books and all of those materials, because it seemed that very few people in Ohio even knew of this place called Newark Earthwork Mounds. And if you have not been there, you do not know what you have missed. It is one of the finest earthworks in the United States. And it is, was built 2,000 years ago by our ancestors. And I say our, not meaning Eastern Shawnee, not meaning Seneca Cayuga, meaning Delaware, meaning Cherokee, meaning all Native Americans who would have been ancestors who were there at that particular time. And 2,000 years ago, they built a series of mounds there at a place called Newark. Those mounds, some of them are four to five feet high. Some of them are 15 to 20 feet high. Some of them are miles long. All of those mounds were built not from the soil there at Newark, but rather it was a gathering religious place where Native Americans from throughout North America came and practiced and participated in their spirituality and in their religious gatherings. They brought Mother Earth from wherever they came, one basket full of Mother Earth at a time. The pyramids in Egypt, fantastic work, but required slave labor, forced to do it. That is not the situation at Newark at all. People came, people brought Mother Earth because they wanted to, because they wanted to be there, because they wanted to worship in their mode. One of my favorite places in the United States is a place called Arlington National Cemetery. Arlington National Cemetery is a place we know that is associated with death. But when I go to Arlington National Cemetery, and I believe when you go to Arlington National Cemetery, we don't go there and grieve. We don't go there and come back crying. We don't go there and come back depressed. We don't go there and feel worse because of having been there. Instead, we come away feeling enriched. We read the quotations, we walk and we see who's buried there, and we come back with a feeling of honor and a feeling of being rejuvenated, of being re-energized. The day I went to Newark Earthwork Mounds, First, I did not know that there were mounds there. And secondly, I did not know there is a golf course on top of those mounds. And we were there on a Saturday and they were having a large golf tournament. We were not allowed to be on the land they did have a cart path 
where you could walk and there is a wooden platform viewing station. We wanted to walk to that wooden platform viewing station to look out at Newark Earthwork Mounds. But the employees were driving golf carts. They were transporting golfers from one location to another. They were transporting spectators, visitors, family members from one place to another. They would not let us ride. We were told we could walk, which was not that far. And so we tried to walk on that graveled pathway, but we were told by the cart path drivers, you're in the way. We have to get by here. You need to get back. You need to step back. And we stepped back and we tried to be as courteous as possible, but they kept saying things. And finally they said, you shouldn't be here today. You don't belong here. You need to go home. You need to come back some other day. Newark Earthwork Mounds was open to the public one day a year. And when told, you don't belong here, they didn't know that I was a chief. That had nothing to do with it. I was simply, in my words, a Native American wanting to see something that my ancestors had helped build, love, preserve, respect, take care of. Ultimately, I made it to that wooden platform, that viewing station. I stepped up the steps and I looked out. Because of all of the World Heritage sites that I had seen, because of my experiences at Crowder College, the minute I looked out and saw what I saw, I knew that I was seeing something that was the equivalent of any of the greatest World Heritage Sites in the world. I knew that this was something spectacular. And at first my heart was filled with joy and I was so proud because you see they had made every tribe leave Ohio. And maybe the people had had to leave but why would there be a need to destroy what our ancestors had made and made so majestically? And where was any respect? Where was any honor? Where was any consideration of what those mounds meant? And my joy turned to questions. I was aware that Ohio Historical Society was in charge of 56 different historical sites in Ohio, and they were in charge of Newark Earthwork Mounds. And they had leased these mounds, this land, to a place called Mound Builders Country Club a lease that goes until 2078. More than 50 more years. And my questions turn to how could this happen? Who let this happen? Why did this happen? And why hasn't something been done about it? And my joy then turned to anger. And I left that site, walking down those steps, crying, thinking of a biblical scripture that says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I left that site that day saying, I do not know what can be done about this. I do not know what one voice can do, but I do know I cannot be silent. It was Ohio History Connection who had some people on that tour and I began asking questions. And I came back 
to Ohio, and I came back to Ohio, and I came back to Ohio, meeting with Ohio Historical Society, saying, this is not correct. Why did you do this? What is the solution? How do we do this? At first, the meetings were not friendly. At first, the meetings were not productive. At first, there were excuses, excuses, excuses. But gradually, I guess when they decided I was not going to be silent, gradually they began to listen. And then their CEO had a major heart attack and died and they hired a new CEO, a gentleman by the name of Bert Logan. Bert Logan was a historian. He had graduated from West Point. He didn't have any experience with Native Americans at all. But when he came and I visited with him, he made me a promise. He said, I don't know why this happened. I don't know how this happened. I don't know what our responsibilities are, but I promise you, I will look into it. I will do the research and I will get back with you. And Bert Logan did. That was in 2007. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, about 10 of us went to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia for World Heritage. There are approximately 1,200 World Heritage sites in the world. The finest cultural, the finest historical, the finest places in the world. The idea began with the United States, but we had only 24 World Heritage Sites in the United States. About three weeks ago, we had the 25th World Heritage Site designated, and that was the Newark Earthwork Mounds. We've been to court three times. We've won all three court battles, but we have one more court battle to go because we legitimately owe them the money for the lease that goes until 2078. We calculate that that was, is somewhere about two and one half million dollars that we will have to raise. Mound Builders Country Club estimates that it's worth 22 and one half million. And so we will go to court again next week, starting about Monday or Tuesday, and we'll have a jury trial, and we will find out what the jury decides as to what we have to pay. But we are already designated a world heritage site and it is indicated in that that they will have to vacate those premises at a certain point and so I come to you saying just as I said our battles are never over we have challenges and one voice can make a difference and you can be that one voice because there are many different things that we as Native Americans or indigenous people still have to fight for our communities, for our culture, for our ancestors. I'm proud to be here with you today and I thank you. I thank this wonderful conference and Bonnie, everything that you have done, you have been so gracious. And I am so pleased to be able to report to you that we have the 25th World Heritage Site in the United States today, and it's located not too far from you, and you should go and see it. Thank you. I'm sure that deserves a standing ovation, too, if I can urge you on. We have taken students to Newark. We have taken stewards to, students to Newark. It's amazing.
Thank you. As I say, I don't use notes, but I do have one note here, and I didn't even pay attention to that one note. So let me read you a quote that I use. And it indicates, and this is actually a, a Creek proverb. We warm our hands by the fires that we did not build. We eat the fruit of the trees that we did not plant. We drink from the wells that we did not dig. And we stand upon the shoulders of giants who have gone before. And that's what these people were. You and I have lived in a time of the world when at least what my people have been referred to so many times are savages. And now to hear them referred to as geniuses, as uncommon geniuses, I can't begin to describe to you how that makes me feel. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Glennon. If you could um, hold for just a moment, we have uh, a question, and we may have a question or two coming on the Zoom call. But thank you so much. I first went to the Newark Earthworks in 2005 uh, when there was the gathering that fall and for the lunar, uh, for the moonrise, and I was astounded. Astounded. I grew up in Iowa and I knew about the effigy mounds up in northeast Iowa on the Mississippi Bluffs, but I'd never heard of Newark, I'd never heard of Cahokia, I'd never heard of Grave Creek Mound in West Virginia. And these are monumental accomplishments that have stood the test of time. I always ask my students, they can vouch for me, I think, I always ask them, what, what do you look around and see today in our society that has been made in our lifetimes that you think will be here in 2,000 years? And no one can ever come up with a good answer. So Bob Perner is one of the people on our faculty who has led students over to Newark. And the uh, late Darla Spencer, who was an archaeologist, did the same in her Mound Builders course. And uh, I've arrived there with students. We, we usually stopped at Cahokia and went to the Washington University powwow, or went to Newark and went on up to the Ann Arbor University of Michigan powwow. And Bob would do a beautiful job of connecting ancient ceremony, music, you know, some of the figurines and, and carvings and so on depict some of the same sort of things the students were about to see at a major powwow with gourd rattles and bustles and all kinds of things. So I'm so proud of you and grateful. Thank you. So we have a question here. There's a comment from the virtual audience thanking you for your presentation and a question from our audience in person. Why was the Serpent Mound northwest of Locust Grove, Ohio, one hour east of Cincinnati, not included in the Hopewell ceremonial earthwork site? Uh, and would the Serpent Mound be added or have its own designation as a World Heritage Site? Serpent Mound was not added because it's not of the time, time frame. Um, and so it would have been misleading. And yes, it's already been discussed that it, it will be, it's on the tentative list now, and they will pursue it. Hi, thank you, Chief Wallace, for your talk. Very inspiring. I wanted to um, say something about Tecumseh, the great Shawnee chief. Mm -hmm. um, this is from, just I want to read a paragraph from uh, March of 2022, an article. It says, it's widely accepted that Tecumseh was born in what's now Ohio, but a handful of historians contend that one of the most influential Native Americans in history was born in what's now West Virginia, where a statue now missing was once raised in his honor. There's evidence, he says, Travis Henline says, there's evidence he was born here in what's now Lewis County, West Virginia. Uh, Travis Henline is a history professor and curator of indigenous history and culture at Jamestown Settlement. He, um, he says he, uh, Tecumseh reportedly came through the Lewis County area in the late 1790s after the 1794 Treaty of Greenville. And during the visit, Tecumseh reportedly commented that he was born, quote, born in this country. A native village once stood on Hackers Creek at present day Jane Lou, and it may have existed in 1768 when Tecumseh was born. So I just wanted to share that, um, that Wikipedia still says Tecumseh was born in Ohio, but maybe that can be corrected someday. I'm going to say that I don't know that, 
I don't know the answer to that, and I've never heard of that. I would suggest you not tell Governor DeWine of Ohio that. Um, it, it is thought, at, at least, uh, the, there is a, a new uh, tribute to the three Shawnee tribes that's being built there at a place called Xenia, or near Old Town, where it is thought that Tecumseh was born in that area. And Governor DeWine was also born in that area and raised in that area. And he has, uh, there was an, an old motel there for many years called the Tecumseh Motel. And that uh, uh, motel became decrepit and uh, Governor DeWine with uh, being the governor of Ohio saw to it that the state of Ohio purchased that motel. And they have now declared that to be the, is it the 75th? state park in Ohio, and they are building an interpretive center there. It's one of the things that I see so many different things happening in Ohio, and being um, Native American and becoming more aware of the history that they had there. And um, started out from day one that they have involved the three federally recognized Shawnee tribes from Oklahoma in the design of that, the construction of that, what will be in that building and uh, started out being, a, they thought, about a $2 million project. It's now up, Chief Barnes is at something like 12 million project and should be finished uh, sometime in the spring when we're all hoping to go there. So um, I would say uh, Governor DeWine would not agree with that. Thank you very much. and. Full disclosure, Travis is one of our graduates from ages and ages ago, and he actually has a new job over in Virginia now. Okay. He was working in the American Indian Interpretive uh, mm -hmm. Project when it was first launched at Colonial Williamsburg. So um, again, thank you so much. And, and when you talk about the earthworks, I just feel like it's time for us to take a bus trip there once again. And Marty Chatsmith, I have to give a shout out to Marty and to Dick Scheel up at uh, the Newark Earthworks Center because she's always welcomed us with open arms, done a terrific job of interpretation with cultural sensitivity and saying about, you know, in response to students' questions, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that. We don't know that, but we do know this. We do know this. We know that indigenous architects, astronomers, engineers and laborers built this amazing, uh, beautiful uh, earthworks. So thank Marty you Marty Chad Smith and Dick Shields are personal friends of mine, and they were a few of the Ohioans who knew of Newark before I was there, and they had started. In fact, it was Dick Shields who was wanting to have more visitors to the Newark earthwork mounds, and he was trying to find out why Cahokia's attendance had increased so. Mm -hmm. And he made contact with Cahokia, and Cahokia is the one who said that they had received World Heritage designation inscription, mm -hmm. and that made all the difference in the world. So they were the ones, not I, they were the ones who had started trying to get World Heritage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, some of our Native leaders have been invited to go up to Grave Creek Mound Archaeological Complex in West Virginia, and lead curator Olivia Jones, Dr. Olivia Jones, is here. She's also an adjunct here at WVU in anthropology. So that's yet another place that people should, should visit and appreciate. Thank you so much. One more round of applause for Chief Glenna.